Welcome back to DSP Leaders World Forum. It's Wednesday the 13th of May and coming up now is our session on emerging tech, the new wave of innovation. But before we start, a quick reminder that if you want to ask questions later or join the extra shot with Ray the Major programs, then get in touch with us as soon as possible and do it today if you can. Details are on Telecom TV along with our poll question, which we'd love you to complete. And so to our panel, Emerging Tech, the new wave of innovation. As network operators design their next generation networks and figure out their new operational strategies, so they encounter a plethora of new acronyms and terms that sound useful, but may be little more than slideware. So which emerging technologies and networking techniques can simplify network operations, help reduce costs and enhance business opportunities and customer satisfaction without creating new complexities and challenges. Well, let's ask our guests and I'm delighted to introduce Mirko Voltolini, who is Global Head of Network on Demand at Colt, and Andrew Coward, CEO of Lumina Networks. Mirko, Andrew, hello to both of you. Hi, good afternoon. Hi, guys. Hi, Andrew. As we try and cope with the COVID-19 pandemic, are we now seeing the importance of, of having a, a modern, agile and responsive business for CSPs? And you know, what role does transformational technologies, which we've been talking about for a number of years now, what role do these play? Andrew, perhaps we can start with you. Yeah, I, I think it's obviously been hugely interesting to watch how much additional capacity has been placed into networks or is being placed into networks very, very quickly. And uh, it's remarkable to see that that's, that's actually possible and can be done uh, in such a short time frame. And I think for those um, service providers that have been the most successful um, and quick at doing that has been linked directly to the fact that they have automated or have been able to automate a lot of the infrastructure uh, for provisioning, management, control, and so on. Um, so that um, as they add more capacity, it, it can automatically and doesn't require people uh, manual interventions to configure manually test all those kinds of things that would have traditionally happened only a, a, few, a few short years ago. So it, it's, a, it's actually a testament to the, the progress that we've made around automation that this has been possible. And Mirko, same question to you. You know, how has these past few months really underscored the importance of having this robust, agile, and responsive business? Yeah, so definitely uh, has been quite important, uh, and I think we we have uh, uh, built capabilities to to, to support that. Uh, uh, we have seen an increase in traffic demand, uh, which uh, has gone up by 30, 40 uh, percent, and as a connectivity player. Uh, uh, we saw requests for upgrades uh, uh, and for uh, a setup of uh, new capacity, new connectivity. I think speed uh, has been one of the key elements. So besides uh, the, 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 the opportunity of having automation, uh, so no requiring manual uh, manual intervention, uh, being able to set this uh, connectivity up in a, in a fast real-time fashion, uh, uh, has been instrumental. A couple of the things we have seen is, uh, in addition to to speed of delivery and automation, uh, is uh, the the requirements for business continuity and resiliency. So, being able to uh, spin up additional connectivity, maybe alongside the existing connectivity, has been one of the other learning from this uh, this phase. We built uh, an on-demand capability and has been quite instrumental for us to support uh, uh, growth of uh, customer connectivity during the last uh, couple of months. Thanks. And Andrew, has it also highlighted the importance of having a software driven approach for telcos? Well, I think for the telcos that have actually deployed that way at a reasonable scale, then yes, in a, in a number of ways, this is playing out. So software, meaning um, moving to software instances of what were previously hardware elements, such as you know, firewalls, NAT gateways, and so on. So the kind of infrastructure behind the infrastructure. Um, so having that on general compute, um, and being able to turn up instances, um, you know, within the cloud, uh, that certainly helps. But I think um, kind of more important, or just as important, is um, the role of, of software in configuring and managing 
um, the, the networks from end to end. So, for example, when you're provisioning um, a service, having the optical domain, that IP domain, um, the radio domain, all the different elements uh, be orchestrated in one movement um, absolutely makes a huge difference to how quickly you provision. And, and to give an example of that, if you think about how long historically it would have taken just to provision a new service. Uh, so here in the US from New York to San Francisco, I mean, you could be talking six weeks plus um, from, from an end customer perspective. And now with automation tools that are in place, um, you know, certainly with our customer base, uh, you know, that, that provisioning action now takes seconds or minutes uh, versus days or weeks. So, so that's the impact, if you like, of having um, you know, software tools and management um, across the network that, that looks at these things kind of end to end holistically versus, you know, individually manually configuring these things. And Mirka, you highlighted the importance of business continuity, um, but what, what also about the, uh, the supply chain? Has the past few months um, shown that we maybe need to pay more attention to the supply chain and, and broad, more broadly the, the whole sort of end-to-end -end ecosystem? So, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we, have, uh, we have discovered uh, or seen in practice uh, the, the requirements to have a very robust uh, supply supply chain in place. Uh, I mean, luckily we have uh, uh, a number of uh, suppliers uh, in the network space uh, and we have more than one uh, in uh, in each of the, the, the key domains. So we haven't, we haven't suffered this, but uh, certainly made us uh, consider uh, well across the whole, the whole set of layers, uh, how this uh, works. Um, so definitely. Well, let's look ahead um, towards the future, because we are talking about emerging technology and the, the next wave of innovation. Um, I'll ask this to both of you, but Andrew, um, to what extent should telcos be planning now and preparing for tomorrow? How far ahead should they be looking in terms of technology R&D and implementation? Well, I, I think um, telcos always have looked you know, pretty far into the future in terms of planning cycles and, and, and what they look to do. and. And so on, and you see that in in how long it's taking for five G to come to market um, and, and get out there in the real world, and, and not just five G, but the technologies that sit behind that, and some of the benefits we expect to gain from it. Um, those plans ex extend well into the future for most for most carriers. Um, to the point, I actually, we think about it, it's been quite frustrating how long it takes to to get to adoption. Um, but I think perhaps by way of example, if we think about um, SDN. Uh, the control of infrastructure through abstraction um, and those types of things that we've been talking about for five years plus now uh, as being important and relevant. Um, you know, we've only really seen um, the, the kind of large scale adoption of these types of technologies um, in the last couple of years. Uh, and it's taken that, that long for the maturity of the technology to be out there, um, the interoperability um, things and and also if you're deploying things all the regulatory environment so I think uh, we're, we're used to those long cycles uh, I think it's just been said you know in relation to to COVID and what we're going through now if, if we were trying to do this five years ago I think we'd had a very different um, result um, just in terms of the ability to deploy quickly and so on um, so I guess for for all of the hype if you like around a lot of the technologies we've been talking about it this is demonstratively that those things are now um, deployed and deployable at scale, which is why we've been able to achieve the success we have. And Mirka, do, we, do you think uh, as an industry we look sufficiently far ahead or is there a danger that we can look too far ahead uh, you know, and those cycles just get too long and, and things get, get lost? I think you need to have a, a multi-tier approach uh, in terms of uh, R&D and uh, I've been working on, on technology and product R&D for my whole, my whole career. You need to have uh, uh, something which looks into the next uh, 18, 18 months uh, to a couple of years uh, and that's more about existing uh, technology maybe at the early stage of maturity and focusing on use cases and how to adopt uh, uh, those capabilities as fast enough. Uh, and also you need to look into the long term, so beyond, the, let's say, two, three years into uh, more uh, 
difficult to, to predict uh, uh, technologies and capabilities. And I think you have to have a, a balance between the two. But I think in terms of uh, maybe picking up on the comments Andrew made, uh, uh, it's also important to focus on execution. Uh, uh, and if you wait for, uh, you have to have a pragmatic approach. So the, the short term plans needs to needs to focus on adopting technology uh, at, as early as possible without worrying too much about the level of maturity. Uh, uh, otherwise, you will you wait uh, for too long. We've been an early adopter, for instance, of uh, SDN technology, went to market quite quickly as soon as it was available. The same for NAV. And uh, that's imperfect because you don't have the level of maturity, the tools in place uh, to, to manage that technology. But if you wait too long, then uh, you, you you will not reap the benefit. Uh, so that's our, our approach. I think another thing to consider in the innovation uh, R&D area is uh, uh, innovation has changed dramatically over the last uh, few years uh, uh, from an internally focused uh, capability to uh, a customer focused capability. So the uh, the approach uh, of co-creation with customers become instrumental. Uh, you can't anymore just uh, focus internally and maybe work with the suppliers, uh, uh, but working with customers is, uh, is fundamental. The other element to consider is the, the fact that uh, uh, componentization of uh, technology and so the disaggregation has uh, enabled uh, uh, service providers to really uh, innovate. Uh, I think before we have been much more reliant on uh, vendors and maybe monolithic systems uh, to deploy and so innovation in the search of the space has been driven by the vendor uh, the vendor plans and uh, now we have much more opportunities with uh, disaggregation andrew as Mirko has just said um disaggregation leads to some uh, a lot more opportunities um are they reshaping network planning options yeah so um i just, just from well, you've got disaggregation, and you've also got kind of reassembly into into the services that you need. <clears throat> I think it's really interesting if you think about how um, all of the elements that we bring together to put into a network. We first disaggregate and separate them out. Um, think about how we can reassemble them, and then reassemble them through software into what ends up being new services. And so when we think about things like uh, that are coming down the line that we're going to need, um, like uh, network slicing, for example, which is a big topic for, for this whole uh, series and DSP leaders, um, you think about how uh, a slice itself gets brought together from many disparate elements across the network um, to deliver that um, performance guarantee, that latency um, requirement, the bandwidth requirements and the, the, the scale that's necessary. All those come from the fact that we've been able to disaggregate the various components and then reassemble, if you like, into, into what's required for that slice, for that customer, for that application. Uh, and so a lot of the work that's happened over the last few years, um, if you like, around SDN and around NFE is essentially creating these building blocks um, that enable us to then deliver these new service characteristics that are going to be so important for the um, monetization of 5G. Mirko, there's been so much focus over recent years on NFV. Um, perhaps the development of SDN hasn't received the same attention, but how has SDN developed and becoming more uh, suited to your needs? I think you cannot uh, look at uh, NFV without SDN. You may you may be able to do vice versa, but uh, you, you need um, uh, a very strong uh, uh, software control capability to be able to, to reap the benefit of the disaggregation that NFV brings. Uh, we have been focusing on actually building uh, uh, an SDN control platform to enable customers to control uh, services with our on-demand capability. And I think that's has been our original focus, uh, bring to market uh, uh, a capability uh, that uh, would allow our customers to take control of uh, setting up connectivity, modifying connectivity. Uh, NFV comes, uh, comes uh, a, a, along with that uh, as, a, a, as an evolution, uh, as an addendum to, to the platform. So being able to not, not just so, simply software control, software control of uh, connectivity, but also software control of, uh, of uh, individual network functions so on top of it. So there's a combination of two really makes the, the capability quite powerful. Um, I think maybe going back to one of the points raised uh, earlier regarding uh, uh, disaggregation, uh, another element that to consider is a uh, uh, key ingredient in the technology space here is um, a API adoption. 
if I look at uh, what has been happening in the service provider space, so I was talking about the fact that aggregation brings a lot of opportunity. You divide uh, uh, capabilities into components, and then those components can then be recombined in multiple different ways uh, uh, to create uh, uh, services uh, and to enable uh, internal innovation. Uh, that uh, opportunity also comes with a price. The price is complexity. So before, again, we are relying on the vendors uh, to put together all those components, and uh, what we what we used to get uh, is a uh, 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 built uh, a system built up uh, for a certain service and then everybody in the market used to get the same capability and so competition differentiation has been quite hard now with this opportunity of uh, creating uh, different uh, uh, capabilities combining building blocks uh, we have a uh, we have some complexity as well so we need to be able to to bring all those components together and integration has become uh, the challenge internally so we have a uh, moved uh, from just uh, purely uh, deploying um, and integrating um, uh, components with the vendor with our OSS is now in, into gluing together different components and API have become uh, uh, the, the key element of making this as simple as possible. So if we keep our eye on the future, Andrew, what are some of the key technologies that are going to power the DSP, the digital services provider of tomorrow. Can we highlight some of the important tech that we really ought to be watching out for? So one of the key technologies that's that's driving um, a, a lot of the kind of background for this change um, is the move to open source. We think of open source as something that's been around a long time now, um, certainly in compute space, but in networking, um, the adoption is only really uh, begun to pick up over the last couple of years, particularly uh, in the uh, SDN space. Um, and an open source here is, a, is an absolute requirement because it creates this kind of level set. Um, so to Mirko's point around having different vendors and complexity um, that that creates, one of the things that you want to make sure is that you're kind of running off a common platform, an abstracted platform, that means that as vendors come along, um, they're fitting in and slotting into something that's already there that, that you know works that the APIs are standardized um, to your customers, to um, your cloud, to all the different components that, that drive that. Uh, and so th what that means is when a new vendor shows up uh, with a proprietary solution, whatever it is, that's proprietary, then that's great, but it fits into an open source framework so that um, the open source basically is providing this, this kind of control layer, but also the abstraction into the rest of the network. Um, and for all the talk about, um, you know, all this new stuff, uh, the reality is that um, the, 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 the existing network, the network and equipment that's already there, that's, that's going to be there still in five, 10 years time, uh, needs to be controlled and brought into whatever it is that you're doing with these new amazing services and new amazing technologies. And so um, using and leveraging um, platforms that as we do, like um, Open Daylight, for example, uh, where you're controlling the legacy equipment as well as all the new NFE technologies together and abstracting that becomes this important framework. So I guess the argument is that nothing really happens with all this new stuff unless you can basically um, co-opt um, co in, in the existing network into a way that um, enables you to take advantage of all the, all the technology choices that we're going to have as we go forward. So, Mirko, we telcos do have a huge installed base of legacy equipment. That's not going anywhere fast, um, but new technology is coming on. Uh, there's new thinking, new methodologies. What are some of the things that have got your attention um, that you think we need to be looking at and focused on over the coming years? Okay, well, where to start? There's lots of uh, uh, an, an, an increased amount of uh, innovation happening in technology space that we can leverage. Uh, one area we're looking into is uh, the adoption of AI for uh, both internal and for customer uh, use cases. Uh, uh, there's been a, a, a significant, I was, I was mentioning earlier, there's been a significant increase in complexity in managing uh, uh, a disaggregated network, uh, and uh, we believe uh, uh, AI and what we call closed loop automation, where you can use network information uh, coming from the systems and the network uh, to feed back into uh, the control of the, the network itself in an automatic fashion uh, through the adoption of AI and machine learning uh, uh, will be key in managing this complexity. We can't uh, 
uh, rely anymore on again very simple monolithic system or let's say simple monolithic systems uh, uh, for our operations team to manage uh, we need to inject automation not just in the in the creation of services we've been talking about uh, sdn controlled uh, activation and modifications which is our platform uh, what our platform is based on but also uh, automatically fixing fault understanding where uh, to troubleshoot uh, 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 network uh, uh, network issues, uh, so AI plays a key role in that, tray, that space. Andrew, uh, you've already mentioned network slicing um, earlier in the discussion, but you know we we're focused on things like intent-based networking as well. We've got um, what segment routing. We've talked about AI. There's, there's there's a lot of tech coming. There's a lot of tech out there. Um, how much of this is, is tech that really is going to get off the page, get off the PowerPoint um, and, and get into the network now? All right. So you, you kind of have to think about the, the use cases that are playing out here um, in, in terms of what does it actually mean for the end user and, and what are we trying to achieve? So if you take some of the things that um, you know coming to the fore, like um, virtual reality, augmented reality um, over wireless and um, connected car, car-to-car uh, -car communications, all of those things, um, they require that um, the network react in real time um, very quickly, that uh, resources around the network can be moved, um, that chat the problems in the network, uh, to make this point around AI, you know, resolved, um, you know, automatically and quickly. So um, the adoption of the technologies that sit behind the, these services are really what's going to drive, um, you know, whether something succeeds or it doesn't. Um, and so, you know, to the point around network slicing, that's an absolute fundamental building block um, around um, being able to deliver these services, meaning the network isn't ubiquitous anymore. Sorry, it's not, um, you, it, it needs to be different for different applications. Um, whereas if you take things like segment routing, um, very important technologies for scaling um, and, and indeed widely adopted already. Um, so for each of the challenges, if you think about it, to get from the first billion devices to 5 billion devices to 20 billion devices requires a, a step change in the scalability of a lot of these technologies. And so the things that enable that to happen, the things that enable us to scale, are the things that, that win. Um, and, you know, a lot of the things that we're talking about now, uh, frankly, we've been talking about for, for a long time as the kind of baseline of of, of, of yeah, this technology is coming down the line. Now it's baked. Now we're starting to get to some pretty large scale deployments. And I think um, just at the level of scale uh, that the routing requires and the network requires, um, then you know we're, we're into those deployments now, and that, that's great to see. I think what comes down the line next is just this again, this step functions order of magnitude that's needed to to grow these services. Um, when we think about um, the five G, we talk about five G being about handsets. I don't think 5G is really about handsets from a step change. It's really about um, IoT um, and the, the kind of long tail of devices that, that will join the network with all kinds of characteristics that are going to be needed from a, from a simple water meter that reports in once a week um, to uh, having a video crew out on the street um, recording something in 4K um, you know, with an interview taking place on, you know, in real time for, to a 5G network. Those are of kind of extremes of different services that each will be serviced by a combination of these these things that we're now deploying. Mirko, we talk about software a lot when we talk about the emerging technology and new technology. Software gets a lot of attention, but what about hardware and innovation in the silicon? Um, is this an area that is, is just as important? Yeah, it is, and uh, I think the importance is uh, increasing uh, uh, as new domains have been added to the telecom space. So I think traditionally the importance of hardware has been in innovation in speed, uh, photonics, uh, and, and routing. Uh, so uh, increasing more and more uh, the speed of our devices uh, to to be able to cope with the significant traffic demand. Uh, now the other the other domain where uh, is becoming important uh, after the initial uh, deployment is the compute space. Uh, I think we, if you look at the, the evolution of NAV, the initial uh, uh, the initial efficiency of uh, uh, white box uh, x86 based machine was uh, not comparable uh, to the traditional telecom uh, purpose build uh, 
a hardware and now we start to, to see that there is a need to focus on uh, on um, improving efficiency in the hardware space for x86 components and if i look at the unit cost of uh, white boxes uh, they still need to go down to to be compatible with uh, the the cost of traditional applications so i think it's important uh, again uh, certainly the innovation will continue in the in the the pure uh, increasing speed uh, space uh, and now needs to focus more and more into the compute space uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, thinking how do we get uh, or above the more low limitations as now uh, components in the compute space are becoming uh, reaching the, the point of uh, of uh, uh, the maximum capability so this is where the, the focus needs to be at this stage yeah and i think um, it's also about a price point conversation. So I find fascinating. One of the reasons that 2G networks haven't been turned off yet is actually because of IoT and the fact that IoT devices that run on a 2G network you know, don't require a lot of data upload and so on works perfectly well, but it also has an amazingly low cost point. And so for 5G um, to take over, if you like, from IoT, it's not supplanting 4G or 3G technologies. It's supplanting the cost base of of having a 2G modem, we have to get to that price point uh, to get to mass deployment so that you know 5G chipsets show up in everything that we buy from a consumer perspective or are out um, around us as we make our way around the world. So that that cost base is, is really important for the industry to get right um, and commoditize at vast scale. A final question to both of you. Um, this tech in a, this tech uh, development um, and ensuring we have the waves and waves of emerging tech is reliant upon innovation. We do need the innovation to continue. We need a good culture for innovation. Do we have the right environment? Is there anything else we can do to encourage and support the levels of innovation we need? Mirko. Uh, so one of the key things I mentioned already earlier is that uh, this co-creation, uh, we need to move to, an, I mean, to, to, in the past uh, used to be much more much easier for our single organizations to innovate uh, and it was more internally focused than maybe work, working with uh, the, the research uh, uh, industry and now the need is to move to an ecosystem type of environment uh, where uh, as partners uh, uh, vendors competition and customers work all, all together to uh, to co-create capability uh, i think we need to move to a, a more platform-based approach where uh, all the various uh, parties, uh, uh, competitors, uh, and, uh, and producers can really work uh, very, very closely together to to to, to leverage. Uh, I think there is an incredible amount of uh, capabilities now available in the in the in the market. Uh, we talked about IoT, AI, and uh, network plays a key role in that space as well. And Andrew, well, no, we don't have the right level of um, funding and innovation taking place in, 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 in our environment. It sounds very strange to say that given all this wonderful new tech we're talking about. Um, but the reality is that um, the funding, if you like, for um, anything involving this new technologies are often going to players that are thinking about the new applications. So thinking about you know the next killer app, the next uh, Facebook, the next app that's going to uh, consume all our time um, versus uh, the innovation that's required to actually drive the network. And so uh, when we think about funding and the VC community, um, that money is not going into companies um, that are really driving innovation um, inside the network and infrastructure. And that's a problem. Um, and it's, it's not up to, frankly, it's not up to the large incumbent vendors um, to drive that innovation that's just not in their nature um, at, at the pace that's needed. It's for the startup community. That's what's traditionally happened. And so we have a gap right now. Uh, and so for all the wonderful things that we're deploying now, that's great. But I think um, there's a gap between that and, and, and what we're expecting. Um, for example, you know, when we deployed 4G, we were already talking a lot about 5G and what that would mean. We're deploying 5G right now, but there's not a huge discussion around what 6G means. And I suspect that's a lot related to the fact that we don't have this innovation uh, level of investment that's going in um, that's going to create problems down the line. So definitely challenges to come here um, until and unless 
the carriers together with the VC community step up and start investing. Mirko, there's just one more point I'd like to ask you. Um, we, we've talked about a lot of technologies. Uh, we've covered a lot of them here, um, but I don't think we've we've mentioned blockchain. Uh, does does blockchain have a significant role to play um, in the future of CSPs? I think, yeah, it does. Uh, is more in the mid to long term uh, future, although we, we have uh, uh, ongoing activities in this space. Uh, so I look at specifically the carrier to carrier market uh, where uh, there is lots of inefficiency, lots of manual uh, we work, uh, lots, lots of manual processes in place. We work uh, uh, with each other uh, and everybody's reliant on everybody else if you deliver a uh, uh, connectivity services across the globe. So I'm talking about international carriers, uh, whether it is voice and data. And if you look at all the various processes uh, on the overall value chain from uh, sourcing uh, uh, to the financial uh, processes, uh, there is lots of manual uh, steps in place. So we have the opportunity to replace uh, a lot of those manual steps uh, and processes with a uh, blockchain-based uh, uh, technology where carriers uh, can uh, interact and engage with each other uh, using a trusted uh, uh, distributed system. So that uh, will require, I'm, I'm saying that it will take some time because it will require adoption across the carrier community to really make it, uh, make it uh, worthwhile for everybody to, to participate. That's where the area of blockchain definitely is going to be in the space. Well, we're going to continue uh, our coverage of emerging technology as the as the year develops. And Andrew, we've got plenty to say on the subject of 6G, so we shall we shall revisit that very soon. But for now, both of you, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the program. If you have any questions for our guests or any additional comments or views you wish to add, then please do get in touch with us. And if you want to be part of the ongoing conversation, then you need to join us on our brand new discussion program, Extra Shot, with Telecom TV's editorial director, Ray Lemaitre. Get in touch with us now through social media or email. Otherwise, please take a look at the sessions that we've already held. They are all available for on-demand viewing now here on Telecom TV. And we'll be adding future sessions to the archive as the week goes on. Coming up next on DSP Leaders World Forum 2020 is our session on people and processes for cloud native telcos. And you'll be able to watch that tomorrow from 8 a.m. UK time. But for now, a final thank you to our panelists and to you for watching. Goodbye.